welcome everyone uh, to this uh, very unique event. Uh, my name is Sheila Dolby. I'm the president of the Agriculture Society, the Grand Forks and Boundary Regional Agriculture Society. We call it the Ag Society for short, not the Egg Society, the Ag Society. And uh, we are hosting this event with Alex Adamenko, our, our uh, federal MP. And Alex will be saying a few words here in a few minutes. Um, the uh, BC GE Free Society are the folks who are instrumental in this Canadian tour of these very, uh, very courageous and respected <coughs> scientists from, um, from the world of plants and bioengineering. So we are very honored to have these folks here. The BC, the BC GE Free folks have been also extremely supportive of us as hosting organizations, and they've given me exactly the words I need to say. So this is a real challenge for me, because <laughs> I don't usually go with notes. <laughs> so I am in honor of what the work they have done to support us. I'm going to put my glasses on, and I'm going to read their words. This event is one of 32 events happening in BC and Alberta this November and December. Dr. Rain and Dr. Shoka will also be traveling to other provinces next year. Before we start, I want to make sure you know about two important petitions you can sign today on the issue of the GM apple and GM alfalfa. There is also a selection of information and action materials that you can take home to share with your friends and family. Donations from people across Canada have helped make this event possible. We also need your donations tonight. There are opportunities in the back for you to provide those donations. I'd like to now um, ask Alex to come forward and uh, he will say a few words for us. Alex has generously offered um, sponsorship and a support in helping us with the expenses of this. Thanks, Sheila. I won't be here more than an hour. Uh, <laughs> bonsoir, good evening, dobry vecher. Uh, I would just like to, to thank, first of all, all of you for being to coming out to this important event and to the Ag Society for, for co-sponsoring this. This is important. I mean, it's not the first time we've talked about GMOs in this very building. Um, and this conversation has to continue. Um, I had the honor of coming out from Castlegar with, uh, with one of our presenters, Dr. Shiv Chopra, and we had some, some good discussions as to what we can do to follow up on this very important initiative. Um, I would also like to, to welcome, obviously, Shiv and uh, Thierry Yvrin and, and Tony Mimitra, who's there, who's actively involved and, and accompanying the team and taking pictures, and we've been back and forth. Um, just a couple of things. You may, you may, as a result of this meeting, or, or, or see what I call corporate spin. There may be articles by CropLife, by other um, so-called knowledgeable people trying to discredit what we're doing, or what these, these gentlemen are doing. Don't buy into it. Uh, there is a direct, there is an, an, an effort, it's, it's the same people that uh, helped defeat my bill a couple of years ago, that sent lobbyists to have 50 meetings with liberal and conservative MPs, the same, same people that put out ads, the same articles that are written often that I have to respond to that I see in the Western producer. There was one recently written on this so, supposedly golden rice that we had to kind of discredit. So be prepared and, and be prepared to counteract that with the information you get here today because this is, we need to move forward. The other thing I just want to say is there what we have to do from now on is to get this on the political agenda. I'm doing my very best to ensure that it will be a strong plank in our platform, and I urge all of you that belong to political parties, other parties, to do the same. Because if we do that collectively, because this doesn't belong to any political party, it belongs to all of us, we will succeed. It will be a tough road, we'll make it. On uh, ira, let's get going, uh, and on va réussir, we'll succeed. Thank you. We've also been encouraged to say why the Agriculture Society is doing this. 
And Alex has done a fantastic job for a beautiful segue into not only why the Agriculture Society wants to host an event like this, but some of the spin-offs that we can do in concert with federal government. And also, I wanted to maybe take this opportunity, if you don't mind, Sheila, to introduce Sheer Wires, your counselor, to come and say a few words on behalf of the city of Grand Forks. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Sheila and your organization, the Egg Society, what a wonderful evening to have everybody out to learn, listen, and keep an open mind. Yes, we have a lot to learn, don't we, Sheila? And I'm looking very forward to meeting and listening to the, the uh, Dr. Vrain and Dr. Chopra's presentations this evening. I know that uh, for myself, I'm very uh, uneducated in this field. I do know that we, we have a, a huge population in this world to feed. Remembering when I was back in high school in the 60s, there was 4 billion people on this planet. And now we have over 7 billion. So it's going to be a learning curve for all of us. And as, uh, as we all know, the technology and the information that is out there, there's a lot of it. And I'm very, very interested to hear the gentleman this evening. And we're very fortunate to be part of this tour, the speaking tour. And thank you on behalf of the mayor, Brian Taylor, he is attending the uh, Regional District Kootenai Boundary inaugural meeting this evening and uh, running for position of the chair for the, for the 2014. So he extends uh, his wishes to you all and I will pass the microphone on to Sheila. Had a, a, this, this whole event happened at an absolute perfect time for us as an organization. We had just implemented a petition for a GE free boundary region and have begun that work with our local leadership and we are hoping to continue to do that work. We're not very happy with where we are right now but we know it's only just a starting point. So this is where this event is actually a perfect time for us to get informed and better equipped to continue this conversation. So that's a lot of the reason why we are here tonight, as well as capturing this amazing opportunity to have these folks in our community. So back to the script. Okay. Um, we are really looking forward to tonight's discussion. There will be plenty of time for your questions after theories and shifts talk. Please hold your questions until the question and answer portion of the event. The issue of genetic engineering, which is also called genetic modification, or GM, is very controversial, and there are strong feelings on both sides of the debate. Tonight we will hear from two scientists who have been involved in this issue for many years. They bring a critical perspective from their background and experience. We can disagree and debate, but we ask everyone to please be respectful of speakers and of one another. We are all here to learn and discuss. Now I get the pleasure of reading the bios of our two guests tonight. Dr. Thierry Vrain grew up in France where he completed his undergraduate studies in plant physiology. In 1971, Dr. Vrain moved to Canada and then he graduated from North Carolina State University with a PhD in plant pathology. Dr. Vrain had a 30-year career as a social biologist and a genetic engineer. He worked for Agriculture Canada, where he headed the biotechnology department at the Summerland Research Centre in BC. He managed the research <coughs> programs of 40 professional and technical employees from 1996 until 2002. Dr. Vrain now runs a small herbal organic farm on Vancouver Island, where he teaches soil health. Dr. Shiv Kopras is a senior scientific advisor in Health Canada. He was one of a group of three scientists in Health Canada who publicly criticized Monsanto's data on recombinant bovine growth hormone instead of just, instead of just approving it without question. Thanks to these whistleblowers and grassroots protests across Canada, Health Canada denied approval for bovine growth hormone in 1999. Dr. Chopras wrote the book 
corrupt to the core, memoirs of a Health Canada whistleblower to tell his story. We have copies of that book in the back. In 2011, Dr. Chopra and his two former colleagues received the Canadian Journalist for Free Expression Integrity Award in recognition of their role as individuals who acted courageously in the public interest without thought of personal gain, and in doing so risked reprisals in the form of threats to their careers, livelihood, or personal freedom. Yes, this is Canada. Dr. Chopra is a graduate of a veterinarian medicine he is a microbiologist and a fellow of the World Health Organization. Please join me in welcoming these two very special guests. Thank you. I've been told that I have to talk very fast because I take at least an hour to give this presentation. <laughs> <clears throat> we don't want you to fall asleep. <laughs> the Gene Revolution, I subtitled it A Tale of Two Molecules. You all recognize the double helix, of course. I'm going to talk about DNA and genetic engineering. But I'm also going to talk about the other molecule, the smaller molecule. It's glycine methyl phosphonate. The chemical name has been shortened to glyphosate. It's the active ingredient of the herbicide Roundup. And I'll be talking about Roundup. So this is what I'm going to do tonight. I'm going to tell you what GMOs are, because most people are a little bit uh, fuzzy about it or confused, how they are created, and what they do, and what they deliver. And then I will be talking also about Roundup after that. So what, what are GMOs? Well, GMOs are, we have about almost 500 million acres of genetically modified crops right now on the planet Earth. And 90% of those plants are engineered to resist, to tolerate the herbicide Roundup. So it's not about golden rice or soil tolerance or drought resistance or any of those things. I call, those these, I call these distractions. The whole thing is about selling a chemical, a pesticide, the herbicide Roundup. So that's what GMOs are, mostly. So we have Roundup Ready corn, Roundup Ready soybean, canola, potatoes, wheat, sugar beet. Every major crop has been engineered to tolerate, to resist, to survive the herbicide Roundup. And that's what GMOs are. There is a smaller trait called BT. HT stands for herbicide tolerance. And Bt is the name of a bacteria, Bacillus thuringiensis, which produces a protein that kills insects. And so a genetic engineer can take the gene that makes the protein, put it in the plant, and create a plant that is actually a pesticide, because every cell of the plant now contains the protein that kills the insects. When the insects come to feed on the plant, they die. So this is a minor trait, about 10 to 15% of engineered plants of the 500 million acres have this trait, Bt. But mostly 90% are about herbicide tolerance. That's what GMOs are. Now you know as much as I do. There is no doubt that the technology has been, in, is, is incredibly successful. Okay, it's about weed management. The people uh, in the biotech industry who invented this technology knew very well what they were doing, and they knew that weed management is a real serious headache for the farmers. 80% of all pesticides are, are herbicides. So weed management is the number one preoccupation of the farmers. And you come with a technology where you say, well, don't worry about your weeds. Never mind your weeds. Don't, don't even look at them. Just plant your seeds. And then when your seeds are grown, just spray, and all your weeds will disappear. It's magic. The farmers absolutely love it. It makes their life easier, and it makes their farming cheaper. And so they're supposed to make more money. I don't know if that happened. But anyway, from in 1996, when the first crops were commercialized, basically we start at zero on the left side of the curve, to 2010 or 2013 today, over 90% of soybean are engineered. Almost 90% of corn is engineered. 100% of sugar beet is engineered. 
and on and on. Canola, over 90% of canola is engineered. It's an extremely successful technology. If you're a farmer and you're not using this technology, you're back in medieval time. How are they created? There's two technologies to do this. The first one is to use a bacteria, a simple, normal bacteria. It's very common in nature, and it is the original genetic engineer. This bacteria transfers its gene directly to the plant. And this is what genetic engineering is. It's called natural gene transfer. Bacteria can transfer genes to each other directly, which uh, animals and plants do not do that. Animals and plants, you know, you, you get your genes from your parents. You don't give your genes to the person sitting next to you. That's what bacteria do. And this is what genetic engineering is. Genetic engineering is direct gene transfer, not sexual reproduction, which is what normal breeding is. When you breed plants, which is what we've done for 10,000 years, this is breeding, this is normal sexual reproduction not lateral gene transfer like bacteria do. So this bacteria can do that. When you know how it transfers its gene and you're a genetic engineer, you can clip out the genes that it does normally transfer to the plant and put the genes you want. And normally what you do is you put the gene you want, could be a gene from anywhere. Could be a gene from a bacteria or from a fish or from a human being. And then next to it you put what is called a marker gene, which is an antibiotic resistance gene also from a bacteria. You know, bacteria can become resistant to antibiotics. It's very common. So now you have those two genes um, in the, ba in the uh, bacteria, and the bacteria, when it comes to the plant, will transfer its genes because that's what it does. And now the plant is engineered. And the other technology is called a gene gun. Looks like a hairdryer. You're shooting pellets, mm, tiny, tiny pellets, into the plant cells. And on the pellets, you have glued the two genes that you want to introduce into the plant. So you shoot your pellets. One or more of the pellets will end up into the nucleus of a cell. And then the genes will migrate and be integrated into one of the chromosomes of the plant cell. And when you, well, either, a either a technique that you use, either the bacteria or the gene gun, you um, dissolve the cell walls of the, of the plant cells, of the tissue, and then you have a whole collection of plant cells. You put that on the Petri dish with antibiotic, and the antibiotic will kill all the plant cells, except for the ones that have been engineered, that now have a bacterial antibiotic resistance gene. And so they are able to resist the antibiotic. So now you can regenerate a whole plant through tissue culture. And that plant, every cell of that plant will have the two genes that you want. The gene of interest and the antibiotic resistance gene. So today, we have 500 million acres of engineered plants and every cell of every plant has an antibiotic resistance gene. That's how they are created. So what do they deliver? Well, that becomes interesting. Basically, I'm going to review four of the promises of the biotech industry. That this technology reduces pesticides. This technology increases yield. This technology has no effect on the environment. And of course, the food is perfectly safe to eat. So reduction of pesticides. Well, if you had a lot of money and you invested your money into a large chemical corporation and you were at one of their meetings with all the other investors and they are very proud of what they do and one of their team of engineers comes into the room to describe this new technology that they've invented. And they say, we are going to reduce our sales by 50%. And you've invested all your money in this company. And they go, are you crazy? Of course not. This is not at all what happened. They knew very well that they would uh, multiply their sales. And indeed, 
the sales of Roundup has shot, have shot through the roof in the last 15 years. The technology is extremely successful, so of course, the sales of Roundup have gone high and high and high every year. But also the growers have become used to apply a lot more than they used to. Because they can, because now the crops are resistant to the herbicide and they can get perfect weed control. So there's absolutely no reduction in pesticide, quite the opposite. And now, in the last 10 years, also what we have is evolution. The weeds have evolved to become resistant to the herbicide. This is normal biology. Everybody could have predicted that. And so we have now on, in North America over 40 species of weeds that are resistant to the herbicide Roundup. They are, in half of the acreage in the USA is infested with one or more of those weeds. They are in Ontario, in Alberta, in Saskatchewan, and in Manitoba, and not yet in British Columbia. And they are on their way. They will be here this year, next year, very soon. It's normal biology. It's to be expected. Every biologist could have predicted that, and they did. And so, of course, the company knew very well that that was coming. So they have had years to prepare. And so now we have the next generation. We have the next technology. We have corn and soybean resistant to 2,4-D. And 2,4-D is the next herbicide. Some of you will remember 2,4-D. It was Agent Orange in the Vietnam War. 2,4-D has a history of toxicity. It causes Parkinson's disease. And when 2,4-D sales become what we have had with Roundup, we're going to have serious, serious problems. Definitely in the farming community to start with. So no reduction in the use of pesticides. But they do increase yields, don't they? Well, no, not at all, actually. And there is no way to imagine how this technology could increase yield. Yield, like drought tolerance or soil tolerance, is an incredibly complex trait. It involves hundreds of genes. And this technology is good at putting in one gene or a handful of genes, but not hundreds. So there is no way that this technology can increase yield directly. And this is not what has happened at all, actually. This graph here shows is a compilation of the uh, data from Europe and North America. This is the corn yield of corn in Europe over the last 20 years <coughs> compared to the yield of corn in North America over the last 20 years. And the yield of corn in Europe 20 years ago were lower than in North America. And the yields of corn in Europe are higher today than in North America. The technology does not increase yield of corn. And it does not increase yield of soybean either. This document published in 2009 shows the results of studies done in the USA in several universities with soybean showing that the engineering process of the plant, just engineering the plant with the herbicide trait actually has a physiological cost. The plants do not grow as well, and they do not yield as well. There is what is called a yield drag of 5 to 10%. And the growers know that, and they are willing to forego some yield for the convenience of perfect weed control. No increase in yield. And do they impact the environment? And I'm just going to address two points here. The first one is called gene flow or contamination. Basically, if you have a field of engineered plants next to a field of organic plants like corn, next to a field of organic corn, the, the pollen will fly around from one field to the next. Meaning that if you're an organic grower and you're growing corn, your field is going to be contaminated some of your grain will be engineered. And if you have more than 1% contamination, you will lose your certification. You cannot export your crop or sell it as organic. And if you're really unlucky, 
Monsanto will come after you next year because you have stolen their technology. And this has happened to hundreds of farmers, including Percy Schmeiser in Saskatchewan, a canola uh, breeder and farmer, who stood up to Monsanto when his fields were contaminated and he was sued by Monsanto for basically stealing their technology and he went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. And the Supreme Court of Canada found him at fault and said basically you have uh, Monsanto's technology in your field, it should not be there, you are, uh, you are guilty. That's contamination. We have lost our market for canola and for flax to Europe and other countries because of this problem. It's not just that the pollen is flying, it's also that once harvested, it's very difficult to keep the grain separate from one field to another. And so you get contamination this way. And this is what happened with the flax. A lot of people are seriously um, um, concerned with alfalfa because now we have a registration for alfalfa. And so we are going to have a lot of GE alfalfa contaminating all the alfalfa in Canada. The next problem is called genetic pollution. Uh, genetic pollution, I'm, go I'm just going to address a point here, which is antibiotic resistance. <clears throat> if you eat engineered corn or soy, by the time you are digesting it, by the time it is in your intestine, it is not completely digested and there are still some strands of DNA that are intact, enough for the bacteria in your guts to pick up the bacterial genes from the plant DNA. That's genetic pollution. And if your bacteria pick up an, antibacterial, an antibiotic resistance gene, which is one of the two genes that is in the plant, then you become an antibiotic resistance factory. This, of course, is, um, happens at a very low rate. It's not all that frequent, but it's definitely documented and it's definitely happening. When the plants are in the field, also the bacteria in the soil can pick up the bacterial transgenes from the plant. And again, this happens at a very low frequency. But remember what I said, there's 500 million acres, <coughs> 10,000 plants per acre. I don't know how many millions and hundreds of millions of cells in a plant. Each cell has an antibiotic resistance gene. We're up to the 10 to 2 to 20 power of antibiotic resistance genes in nature today. Even if this happens at a very low rate, it is happening every day. The Chinese, we don't do this uh, sort of work in, uh, in Canada or in the USA, but the Chinese last year in the Sichuan University published a study. They looked for antibiotic resistant bacteria in their rivers, and they found antibiotic resistant bacteria in every river they sampled. And the antibiotic resistance gene was a synthetic gene from a lab or from the local transgenic crops. So that spread of antibiotic resistance, and I think it is a serious problem, and the medical uh, establishment should definitely uh, take it very seriously. So GMOs do impact the environment, and GMOs are, are they safe to eat? Well, it depends how you look. In the late 1980s, the biotech industry introduced the concept of substantial equivalence. And the concept of substantial equivalence works like this. Imagine that I am a large chemical corporation and I have just created a new variety of corn. And I want to go to the patent office to get it patented so that it is protected. If you go to the patent office with your invention, you have to prove and show and demonstrate that it is unique 
that there is nothing like it on earth. So I go to the patent office with my new variety and I say, I have this new variety of corn and it has a new gene and a new protein and it is unique and it, there's nothing like it on earth and I get a patent. And then the next day I go to the regulatory agency and I say, I have this new variety of corn and it looks like corn and it grows like corn and it tastes like corn and it's very much like all the other corn varieties. It is substantially equivalent. And because it is substantially equivalent, I do not need to do any kind of testing. And because of this concept, none of the engineered crops today have been tested by the regulatory agencies in the USA or in Canada. And if you write to CFIA or Health Canada, since they've moved to Health Canada today, uh, to inquire about the safety of these crops and about the safety of the food, you will be told that they've been assessed with a very long assessment process. It's a, another word for paperwork. <laughs> this is what you will read on the CFIA website. All novel products, food products, containing proteins, expressed by GMOs are assessed for their potential to be toxic or allergenic to humans. Many people are looking at a piece of paper to make sure that it's safe. But there is no testing per se, or feeding, feeding uh, experiments with rats. The feeding experiments with rats are done elsewhere. They are done in Europe and in other countries in the world because they do not accept the concept of substantial equivalence. There is one phenomenon that happens, and I'm not going to take the time to explain it uh, too long. It's basically when you forcefully introduce a gene construct with a gene gun or even with a bacteria into a foreign genome, remember these are bacterial genes, genes from bacteria into a plant, they are placed under in a completely different environment and the regulatory uh, sequences of the DNA in the plant are completely different than what the bacterial genes are normally used to and because of that there's a lot of collateral damage and there is a lot of new proteins created, <coughs> proteins that are not what the, the genetic engineer want. And those proteins are damaged. Basically, the genes don't know what to do. They're just kind of doing, making proteins, but they're not the right proteins. And you get a lot of truncated proteins and, and deformed proteins and mutated proteins. And this is out of Belgium. Engineered corn, soybean, and canola all have those variant proteins different from what the biotech industry reports. And for collateral damage, this is out of the Journal of Proteome Research, 43 proteins in engineered corn plants were significantly disrupted compared to non-GE plants. In 1996, the, the Food and Drug Administration in the USA has a large body of scientists, of toxicologists, and they are the gatekeepers. They are there to make sure that new processes, new molecules that are going into the food are safe. New pharmaceuticals are safe. And those scientists in 1996, they all predicted that this technology would create new proteins that could be toxic or allergenic or create other problems. And they went to warn their director publicly and to warn him to say this technology must be thoroughly tested before it is released commercially. And their director ignored the opinion of his experts and decided to commercialize those crops without any kind of testing. Their director was Mr. Michael Taylor. 
Mr. Michael Taylor had worked for Monsanto as a lawyer. Then he had been put in place as the head of the FDA by the White House. And then when he was done with his task, he went back to Monsanto as a vice president. And a few years ago, he was put back in place at the FDA to make sure the corporation is properly treated. So we were well warned. And what we have seen over the last several years, over the last 10 to 15 years actually, is a lot of experiment studies done in Europe mostly and other countries showing very much this kind of problem. Toxicity, allogenicity in rats. Um, there's uh, the Bt protein, I mentioned the bacteria, uh, that is um, pesticidal in the plant. And these Bt protein have been shown also to be severely allergenic. And there's quite a few, uh, quite a few examples of that. Bt corn causes anaphylactic shock. Mice fed engineered soy have damaged liver. Many, uh, many studies show organ damage, particularly the liver and the kidneys. Mice fed engineered soy have damaged testicles, uterus, and ovaries. And then there's a study, this was the first alarm bell in 1999. This is published in one of the most prestigious medical journals in the world, the, the Lancet. <coughs> and this study was done with rats fed engineered potatoes, and in 1998, the um, experiment was aborted because the results were so obvious that there was plenty of organ damage in the rats after four months and the uh, study was aborted because of that. And then one year later it was published. This is the lining of the stomach which was labeled precancerous. And this is the last alarm bell. This is from a year ago. And this, there's quite a bit of history on this paper here. Um, this is basically an experiment from Monsanto. Monsanto, when they came to France wanting to um, commercialize their engineered corn, the French government said, yes, but not so fast. We need some testing here. We're not in the USA. So they did a test for three months. They chose a strain of rats. They decided on a protocol of research and fed the rats engineered corn for three months. And after three months, their statistical analysis showed that there were no differences. The rats were perfectly happy. And one of the uh, scientists in France was quite intrigued because he had done some preliminary research and knew that there was some toxicity involved and asked to see the data, was refused, went to court, obtained the data, reanalyzed it, and showed that his analysis showed that after three months, there were signs of toxicity. And he showed uh, his analysis to the biotech company and the regulatory agencies, and they said, well, yeah, but your significant differences here are bi biologically irrelevant. And if you are in science, there is no such thing as biologically irrelevant when your statistical analysis shows significant differences. So he decided to repeat the experiment. He took the same strain of rat, the same protocol of research, everything the same, except he increased the length of time from three months to two years, which is the life of the rat. And he also decided he wanted to test Roundup. And after three months, there were some signs of toxicity. After four months, there were clear signs of organ damage, particularly kidney and liver. And then after a few more months, breast cancer. And some of you must have seen those pictures. It was a year ago. They were all over the internet. Huge mammary tumors. That was published, peer-reviewed and published exactly a year ago in this journal, Food and Chemical Toxicology. And the corporate science community went absolutely berserk. Not only because of the gross pictures of breast cancer, but also because the results showed that Roundup was incredibly toxic. And the noise level was just 
incredible. A lot of scientists went to support, to, to tell him that, you know, yes, his study was good. But there was so much noise, and the editor of the journal was told to retract the study, and the reviewers had not done their work properly, and the statistical analysis was not good, and he had chosen the wrong strain of rats, and the protocol was bad, and he did not have enough replications in his study. This is Dr. Seralini. He has answered every critique. I've read them. It makes perfect sense. And then, a few months, so basically the study in the, 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 the term for the corporate scientific community is called debunked. So this study has been debunked. It is not valid. It's valid to me and many others. And then a few months later, Monsanto put one of their people in the editorial board of this journal. <coughs> and then a few months later, exactly five days ago, the study was officially retracted from the journal. So it has not happened. The history was rewritten. You can ignore it. It did not happen. Many, I'm, I'm just going to go there. Many of these very uh, famous scientists have been pursued, critiqued, even physically assaulted by the corporate science community, so to speak, um, because they showed, their, the results of their study showed that there was some serious concern with the technology. The first one, 1998, that was the Lancet publication. And then we finished the, the last one with 2012, with Gilles Serralini. Okay, well now, round up. The molecule is glyphosate, that's the active ingredient. Roundup also has several other molecules, like adjuvants and other things, which are extremely toxic, but I'm just going to concentrate to focus on glyphosate. So glyphosate was invented in 1964 as a descaling agent, as a chelator. A chelator is a molecule that can grab onto metals, metal ions. And it's very useful if you want to purify water or other industrial processes. When you go to your doctor, he looks at you and says, you're pale. I'm going to do some blood work. And then you come back a week later and say, yeah, you're anemic. You need iron supplements. You have in your blood a very important molecule called hemoglobin, which carries around oxygen. And in the center of that protein, hemoglobin, there is a metal ion, iron. That's why you need iron. So you have your hemoglobin properly functional. Imagine that in your blood, next to your hemoglobin molecule, you have another molecule like this one, which is competing for the iron. You're in trouble. Particularly if the chelator, the chelating molecule, is a very strong chelator, because it will outcompete the other protein. And this is a very strong chelator, and a very broad spectrum chelator. It grabs onto many, many metals. And it can impair many, many enzymes in the cells. And we did not know that 20 years ago. So that was 1964. 1970 was shown to be a very broad spectrum herbicide. That's when Monsanto bought the patent and made history with the chemical. And then in 2010, they patented it as an antibiotic. And remember what I said about going to the patent office. If you go to the patent office with a new molecule or a new invention, you really have to show that it is really working. So this glyphosate works as an antibiotic. It is toxic to fish. Definitely many studies showing it is toxic to fish. Studies, of course, we've known for a very long time that it is toxic to uh, frogs, amphibians, and many other vertebrates. Teratogenic means birth defect. And we are learning more and more recently that it is actually very antibiotic, but it kills the bacteria in the guts of animals. We are not the only animal to have lots of bacteria in our intestine. All the animals have 
bacteria in their intestine. All animals are symbiotic organisms, like us. Glyphosate basically kills a lot of the bacteria in the guts of animals, meaning that the pathogenic bacteria, meaning that there is no more biodiversity. Now, it's exactly like in farming, industrial farming. If you kill the biodiversity in the soil, then the bad guys can take over, and that's why you need pesticides. <clears throat> this experiment, effects of glyphosate on the enzymatic activity of the liver and intestine in the rat, showed that glyphosate inhibits a family of enzymes called the cytochrome P450, or CYP for short. And if they inhibit CYP, then you get this kind of damage in the rats. And we have seen those, we have seen those symptoms in the rats repeatedly in many, many studies. Gastrointestinal disorders, kidney and liver damage, infertility. And when I say gastrointestinal disorders, I don't mean tummy ache. I mean leaky guts, Crohn, celiac, very serious stuff. A year ago, there was a paper published by a couple of biochemists at the MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. One of them, Dr. Stephanie Seneff, had been studying autism for quite a while, and she just couldn't figure it out. She said the rate of autism has gone from 20 years ago from one in 10,000 kids was on the autism spectrum. <coughs> Today, it's one in 50. And she says, it has to be an environmental factor. It has to be in the air, in the food, in the water. And so when she saw this paper, she went back to the literature to see if these CYP, the cytochrome P450 enzymes were impaired, well, what symptoms could be expected in a human being? And she came up with this list here, same list as with the rats, of course, but then on top of that, obesity, depression, autism, Alzheimer's, because if the bacteria, and this is also, of course, has an impact on your bacteria in your gut, if the bacteria in your gut are impaired, are killed, then you're in serious trouble. Those bacteria are incredibly important to your health. They're in incredibly important to your happiness. They're responsible for 90% of the serotonin in your brain. They're responsible for most of your immune system. And it is known that Roundup glyphosate also inhibits the immune system. <clears throat> the biotech industry is very quick to say, well, you know, it's really safe. Millions of people have eaten trillions of meals over the last 15 years, and nobody has ever been ill. And this is the most unscientific statement you will ever hear, because there is no studies, there is no follow-up, there is no knowing who is eating what, there's no labeling. This is a completely empty statement. But what I what I found recently is a series of curves from a doctor in Seattle who went to the Center for Disease Control in, Alberta, in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and collected the data for all the symptoms that I showed, obesity, depression, Alzheimer's, etc., kidney damage, liver damage. And so she graphed, she put on a graph, she plotted the number of cases this year, next year, etc., every year for 20 years, versus the volume of glyphosate spread on corn and soy in the USA every year. And this is the kind of graph she gets. And the curves starts going up in the mid-1990s when the crop became commercialized. This is the number of children with autism plotted against glyphosate in corn and soy. This is the number of hospitalization for acute kidney injury plotted against glyphosate applied to corn and soy. And we don't have that data in Europe. And this is very recent. This is like <clears throat> three months ago. 
We don't have the data for Europe or for Canada. And all I could find was this curve, is this graph here for children diagnosed with celiac disease at Alberta Children's Hospital. And again, the curve starts climbing in the mid-1990s when canola became com uh, GMO, can canola became commercialized. <coughs> so, to wrap up, well, maybe not wrap up, but at least summarize, basically, I see a good number of flaws in the technology. And the GE crops, the flaws are, there's no increase in yield, there's definitely a problem with contamination, and that's for the farmers, mostly. There's antibiotic resistance, and that's definitely for every one of us and the medical community. And then there's toxic and allergenic proteins in the food. And then there's Roundup. And Roundup is a chelator, creates nutrient deficiencies in the soil, in the plants, and in the animals eating the plants. It definitely is antibiotic and does a, a good job on your bacteria in your guts and everywhere else. And of course there is a problem with super weeds, which means that we're on a chemical treadmill. <clears throat> this is the situation today. 64 countries in the world, in yellow, have banned or demand labeling of engineered crops and engineered food. But as you can see, we don't have that in, in, in uh, North America. And you may want to notice that all the big countries in the world are demand labeling. Russia, China, India, and Europe. So really, it's like a majority of people on Earth. A big majority. <coughs> I'm often asked, well, what can we do? And Basically, I tell people, well, don't, you know, educate yourself, know exactly what you're eating and what your choices are. And, and I summarize it like this. I say, well, you're in the, sto in the grocery store and none of the vegetables are engineered, except for sweet corn. None of the fruits are engineered. When I say engineered, I mean engineered and spread with Roundup. None of the fruits are engineered except for papaya. Then you look at the meat department, and all the animals are raised in barns, fed on engineered corn and soy, spread, uh, sp yeah, spread with the, the, the herbicide. And then you look at the dairy, same story. And then you look at the rest of the store, and you'll have to look carefully to find, in, to find food in the rest of the store that is processed or junk food or baked or prepared that does not contain corn, soy, canola, or sugar. A hundred percent of sugar beets are, are engineered. So avoid industry of prepared food. Organic label is still your best bet because there's a one percent contamination uh, allowed. And I hope everybody knows what the natural label means, natural means nothing. Natural means it could be sprayed with all the pesticides in the world and be engineered and anything else and it is labeled natural. It's a trick from the food industry. Make your voice heard. This is, this is probably the most important part. It's not going, nothing is going to happen, in my opinion, from my own, from the top. The government is not going to act. The, the, the politicians are not going to be the leaders in this particular case. They are going to follow you. So this is up to you. Talk to your friends. Talk to your family. Talk to your neighbors. Talk to your grocery store manager. 20 years ago, there were no organic produce in the store. And people started demanding organic produce. And look, today, if you demand it, they will appear. Ask your grocery store manager, where are your non-engineered foods in the store? He might look at you and say, what's that? You can educate your grocery store manager. Talk to your counselors. One of them is here today. Talk to your mayor. And if you're really angry, let it be known. <laughs>
quite a few mothers come to me and say that they look exactly like this, you know. <laughs> mothers protect their children, just like grizzly bears. This is a very good publication that I highly recommend you to look at. It's available online for free. You can download it from this um, website, earthopensource.org, earthopensource.org. When you come there, there'll be a, you can't miss it, it's right there. It's about 120 pages long. It is a compilation of research studies done by a genetic engineer in London, England, published a year ago. He became quite fed up with the propaganda from the biotech industry saying that everything is normal, everything is safe and go back to sleep, when he knew very well that there was a lot of publications, mostly out of Europe, showing serious problems. So he compiled all that, and then his work was rewritten by a science writer, so it's in plain English. You don't need a university education to read it. And it is really well documented. Thank you. Good evening. We now, Dr. Brian and I, have been uh, speaking across British Columbia for a couple of weeks. He, more than I, just took a little break and we're back here. Even in those few days, things are changing in many ways. Number one is a very positive effect. And uh, that is the way the public is reacting to this issue now. Ten years ago, I um, toured across BC, and it was a different kind of audience. People were mostly either farmers or some NGOs, activists, and so on. This time around, we're seeing uh, people, mothers, children, grandmothers, and even some politicians. And particularly today, it's very fortunate that I was able to spend an hour or so with, with Mr. Elemenko. I had heard that he, he, ha, he is the only politician, as a matter of fact, at the federal level, the only politician who has been at this issue for some time. And, uh, but, and then now some provincial politicians are beginning to take note of it, and particularly councillors. And I'm going to come back to that uh, toward the end as a solution because wherever we go, people seem to have been fairly well educated. They know what GMOs are, what genetic, they may not know about the entire technology or the extent to which, uh, how GMOs and genetic engineer, engineering has infiltrated uh, in entire uh, health and life system. We're talking about crops. It's not just the crops. It is seed. It is fruits. It is products going into milk. It is going, GMOs are now in vaccines. <coughs> the, this genetic engineering is, is as though genie has been let loose and is affecting health and life, survival. Survival of our human species, in a sense. And it's being done by a few corporations, all in the last few years. And they have taken over. 
They've taken on politics, they've taken over law, whereby governments themselves are breaking the law. And I'm now going to explain to you what the law is. Sometimes we say it is the Canadian Food Inspection Agency who's, who's responsible. Sometimes we say Health Canada is responsible. People have forgotten that there is only one organization, only one department in Canada that administers the law of health and safety. Canadian Food Inspection Agency only inspects the standards set by the Department of Health or Health Canada. Health Canada administers a law in this country which is 100 years old. It is called the Food and Drugs Act. <laughs> Food and Drugs Act has been evolved <coughs> over 100 years through experience, bad experiences. Originally, back in 1896 or somewhere there, it was called the Adulteration Act because people were mixing all kinds of things to make drugs, uh, sometimes mostly alcohol, turpentine oil, this and that, and they were killing people. As a result, the first addition of it, in a sense, it was called the Adulteration Act. So that whatever you sell, manufactured stuff for health, food, whatever, anything which is manufactured must be pure and unadulterated, chemically. That went on for quite a number of years, and now drugs, actual drugs, were beginning to come on the market. The first drugs that came out for controlling infections were sulfonamides. Sulfonamides, some of you may remember, were large pills, could not be dissolved in water, and were very difficult to give to children. So somebody came up with the idea that they take the sulfonamide pill and dissolve in some kind of a solvent and then add some water and then add the sugar and maybe some fruit flavor and then people would drink the syrup. Well, 38 of uh, 100 Americans died in 1938 as a result of that uh, incident. What had happened, the solvent they used was the same is, is ethylene glycol, it's the same stuff that you use as your windshield wiper fluid. It's extremely toxic. That resulted in, a, in the revision and the first time it was called the Food and Drugs Act in 1945. I'm going to explain this a little bit, especially uh, Mr. Eremenko is here, he's a member of parliament, they deal with these things, so all of you should understand what, how to address this issue and what to do about it. We must know what the law is before we deal with the law. Otherwise, we are going writing petitions and we are asking uh, 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 politicians uh, to use the precautionary principle, this and that. It's already there in the law. You don't have to exercise precaution. It's already provided in the law. And the law is attached to the criminal court. I'll come back to that in a second. So in 1945, the Food and Drugs Act, both the United States and Canada, now adopted a system whereby it said that any product that any company wants to sell in Canada, that directly or indirectly gets into the human body, must be proven to be safe and effective as indicated on the label. People talk about label. Label is a requirement of the Food and Drugs Act. You have to have a label, you have to declare what's in it, you have to show that on the label that it is safe and effective as declared on the label. That's the claim of the company. Therefore, the requirement that they placed that all every product the active ingredient as well as the inactive ingredient must be tested separately and collectively in at least two species of animals, one of which must be a non-rodent. So you can't just test it in rats and mice, you must take other animals also. 
like dogs, later on monkeys, and before you get into the humans, it must be tested in at least two species of animals and show that it doesn't kill those animals, it doesn't cause any disease in those animals, and then from there we'll figure out how to interpret that in terms of what it might do to people. That went on for a little while. Then we faced the thalidomide, because at that time in 1945, nobody thought of the human embryo or the animal embryo in the pregnant uh, uh, mothers, what it might do to the uh, newly conceived uh, 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 offspring. And the, that science is called teratology. In other words, birth defects had to be measured. And it had to be done in the first trimester of those species. Now, the first trimester varies in different species, but, but the equivalent portion had to be tested. Humans, uh, the first trimester is three months. In, uh, in uh, rats and mice, 17 days. Uh, that was 28 days. You must, from six day onwards conception, you must test in all these animals. And because these, uh, 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 the issue of cancer also came up, then it was also put in, in the 1967 revision of the Food and Drugs Act that it must also be tested for the lifetime of uh, uh, small species like rats and mice. So that from there, because in, in rats and mice, they live only two years, and they begin to develop cancer after the age of 18 months. As they grow old, more tumors and cancer occur. But if that cancer occurs in younger animals, it's an indication that there's a problem. And similarly, in the humans too. So these studies were adopted, 1967. What we are seeing with GMOs, these technologies came up in the early 80s. Because DNA wasn't even invented, as, uh, 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 invented or uh, proven or studied until 1962. So this whole technology is really very, very new. And all of a sudden, these companies started to say, well, we're going to make new products by this new uh, technology. We'll make genes. We'll tra uh, transfer genes. It's been done in nature anyway. We'll do this and that. They're completely wrong. In nature, you can breed. But within the breed, you can uh, improve a breed. For example, you can make resources. You can... Uh, 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 teach poodles to do tricks. You can do all kinds of things. You can make the cow give more milk. But it's within the same species. You cannot take a um, flower and, and put it into its gene into fish, or take a bacteria into fish, or vice versa. What we're doing with this <coughs> so-called genetic engineering, we're taking a one or more genes from one species, and putting into another species, which nature does not permit. Even if we make seeds, we call hybrid seeds, or we can do that to animals, we can take a horse and a donkey, donkey and a cross and you get a mule, but a mule is automatically sterile, it doesn't produce another mule or a horse or a, or a donkey. The same way when you make hybrid seeds, those he seeds are very often sterile or weaker, they won't, you have to keep on making those seeds again and again and again. But with genetic engineering, you are taking a gene, uh, as I explained, from one species to another. Then, uh, for example, if you take the gene of a cow, which gene, that gene is responsible to produce bovine growth hormone that stimulates milk, that makes the body grow, and it, more of it is produced when the mother is pregnant or the child is growing and the fetus is growing and then later on it settles down, then you only produce the amount that you require for wear and tear of the body or for growing your hair and nails and stuff like that. But if you take that gene of the cow, put it into a bacteria, now the bacteria thinks it's a cow and it must 
keep on producing that hormone at all times, as though it's producing alcohol. As long as you keep feeding it, the bacteria will keep on producing that, that uh, product, in this case, the bovine growth hormone. And because it's done this way, we, call, we don't call it bovine growth hormone, we call it recombinant bovine growth hormone. In other words, the DNAs have been recombined. It has two purposes. On the one hand, you're able to patent it because it's different from the natural bovine growth hormone. And then you say, oh, well, it's the same as the natural, don't need to test it. So this product was made by two companies. Four companies tried, but ultimately two remained. The two companies were Eli Lilly and uh, Monsanto. But the United States had passed a law, the only country in the world that allows that, that not, uh, the living uh, genetically modified organisms and their products can be patented. The only country in the world that allows that. In Canada, we license the product and, and effectively come to the same effect, but we don't actually patent it. So what happened in this case, that um, Eli Lilly felt outdone by Monsanto in the United States because they were making human insulin this, by the same method. So they said, we also want to sell it. The two companies had a fight. They went to court and then they settled out of court and the idea that you will, in the United States only Monsanto will sell, because the patent was given to Monsanto, because the rule was there, whichever com uh, first company comes, first come, first serve, so Monsanto got the patent, Eli Lilly got mad and they came to Canada, they said here our molecule is different from Monsanto's and so we want to test our product in Canadian cows. 1988, this file landed on my desk. And no data. My colleague who had done the review said uh, uh, we should approve it. When I did the second review, because in, in Health Canada, like on, in government departments, first review, second review, bars and laws, gold, all, all the way up to the assistant deputy minister where final approval is given. So in other words, it'll go through several levels uh, <coughs> for review. And so when it came for second review to me, I said, uh, is there any data? Has the company done any research? He said, we don't need any. So why not? Oh, it's the same as the, uh, the, the same that the cow produces. I said, in science, you don't assume anything, because even if it's natural, you start giving injections of it. You could sicken the cow. You, you, it could, it could make the cow sick. It could make its tissues grow. So certain other things could happen, and ultimately, it'll end up in the human body. So therefore, we should ask some tests to be done. And the tests were very simple. I said, take some rats, tell the company, give injections of it, and we'll know whether the thyroid is affected, whether thyroid, and we can measure thyroxine, the hormone, or whether the pancreas is affected, whether it'll produce more insulin, or whether it'll affect the ovary, it'll produce more progesterone, we can measure all those hormones. And he said, well, even if it is, then why worry about the cow? We're only uh, concerned about the milk, and uh, in, in the, if it does appear in the milk, it'll be digested away because it's a protein. So I said, well, in that case, take some rats, inject, inject to some, in, uh, give injections of it to some rats, and feed it to some other rats. Injected rats will produce antibodies. Fed rats will not produce antibody because it's been digested. <coughs> so based on that, I sent that letter to Eli Lilly, 1988. All of a sudden, the file went dead. It got taken away from everybody in Health Canada, locked up, given to one guy, and, and they called him file manager only for this file. It went secret. 
and we are all security cleared. Several years passed, 1993, the United States had passed it. They considered, they see no problem. Now the pressure comes on us, why are you guys sitting on it? The European Union and the Americans said, hey, be careful, this is, this is milk. If you do that, we already now know there's another hormone coming out in the cow's milk. It's called insulin-like growth factor. That's, that is associated with causing cancer. That's coming out in the milk. And also, if you um, produce too much milk from the cows, the cows will develop mastitis and they will be infected and then people will be injecting, uh, farmers will be putting too many, too much and too, too many different antibiotics uh, into the teeth canal and then that may produce superbugs. These two issues, what do we do? The US government, you heard Michael Taylor was sitting there. Monsanto's vice president, he's now heading it. There was another woman called Dr. Margaret Miller. She's in charge. She also worked for Monsanto. Now she's a director at the FDA. The two of them, I said, okay, go ahead and pass it. So the pressure is on us, and meanwhile these objections have been raised. And the US government says, FDA, don't worry about it. We'll test it for two years. We'll clear it now. We'll test it for two years, and then we'll let you know if there's any problem, we'll, we can do something. Hearing that, the European Union said, okay, we'll put a moratorium for two years, we'll wait to see what happens. In Canada, <clears throat> they didn't put a moratorium. Health Canada says, well, we won't approve it until then, we'll wait. Two more years passed, 1995, now more pressure builds up. Again, we're not doing anything. 97 comes. Now the, really the pressure, and the pressure now is coming all the way from the Privy Council and the Privy Council, you know, means and the Prime Minister is the head of the Privy Council and the clerk and the cabinet, they're all together. And the pressure is coming from there. And it's 1996, the government has changed the regulation that the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, now a private agency, is taken out of agriculture. And its job is also to promote Canadian trade in food. They change the regulations without going to Parliament. This is called order and council. They, they just pass regulations without discussing any of this. So Canadian Food Inspection Agency is becoming a body unto itself. And the pressure comes. And we are also, at that time, the scientists in Health Canada, being pressured to pass other drugs as well. Number of antibiotics, a number of hormones for beef production, for synchronizing heat in pigs and cows, a factory farm, all kinds of things are happening. Or clear this for fish uh, and dumping into the ocean. Nothing is approved, nothing is cleared or tested or, or, or uh, evaluated. They just keep on approving it or, or telling us to approve it. A conflict developed and we, six of us, filed a grievance, individually and collectively, that we are being pressured to pass drugs of questionable safety and the pressure is coming from the Privy Council of Canada. Hey, you're accusing the Prime Minister and the Cabinet? Nobody wants to handle our grievance. It sits. But there's another rule under the collective bargaining, and the union rule, collective bargaining. You could receive a grievance, the stipulated times where you have to respond within three weeks, four weeks. This goes on for months. So we finally took this matter to the Labour Board and filed a complaint that the Health Canada management is not dealing with our grievances. It's at that time the National Farmers Union got the wind of it. That we have filed a complaint. It got into the media. Everybody buzzing there. 
and our grievances being heard, and uh, all the cameras come from the you know, doors opening, doors shutting, and so forth. But uh, and at this time, while this is happening here, our director general, food directorate, has decided to pass the bovine growth hormone, and he goes to Geneva <coughs> to announce it without telling us. And he was sitting in Geneva. The National Farmers Union sent telegrams to the Codex Alimentarius in Geneva that we have a problem at home. Don't listen to that guy who's come there. <laughs> <laughs> the Codex canceled the meeting. Our Director General comes back, calls us all on the carpet, and he's pounding on the table, I have to hear about you guys in Geneva. I said, George, why are you telling these people? I'm the one who did it. All I want to know what happened to my letter that I wrote in 1988, we're now in 1997. Then I told him, you're new, why don't you open the file? Let a couple of us see the file, what might be in it, if everything's okay, from the human safety point of view, go ahead. Or you can overrule us, go ahead. But you can't say that we have evaluated it when we haven't, and my letter is still outstanding. Well, he opened up the file, to his credit, with a lot of difficulties. And four scientists were assigned. We wrote a report. I was one of them. All the experiments I had suggested to Eli Lilly had actually been done by Monsanto. And the results were sitting under our noses. And all the, all the results, all my fears came out to be true. The pancreas, the thyroid, the testes, everything was affected. And fed rats also produce antibody. So whatever I thought, predicted, could happen, had happened, and the result was in our own files. You can't blame Monsanto for it. They provided the results. Who do you blame? Our own government. The United States government, they also had the same results. When that report then was tabled in the, in, in, uh, before the Labor Board, the farmers got hold of it. It's a public document now. Health Canada is saying it's confidential. Farmers put it on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one organization started to sell it for five dollars a piece, uh, just mailing charges. And for us, it's confidential. By this time, this, the farmers went to the Senate Committee on Agriculture. They said, bring those guys here. We want to hear from them. So we received an invitation from the Senate Committee. This is no invitation. When the Senate sends you an invitation, it means subpoena. So you can't refuse to go. If you refuse, you lose your job or you go to jail. So when this came, we said, we want guarantees that nothing will happen to us after we go there because this will be a public meeting and we're going to have to tell the truth. People from the Privy Council come to advise us how to speak. <laughs> because only the minister can speak, you cannot speak unless you have minister's permission. You're not the designated people. And the, what minister did, he took the same report, he removed. They removed uh, chapters and pages from the report that we had written. So, when we appear at the Senate, now he's speaking under oath. The Senate says, do you have an opening statement? I said, yes, sir, I do. I said, I have a problem, sir. What's the problem? He said, the problem is this. 
that I just took oath to God to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. But uh, when I joined the public service, I took another oath to remain loyal to the Queen. Now I don't know what truth to tell. The truth, <laughs> the truth that is in my head or the truth that the minister is telling me to tell. <laughs> Senator Eugene Whalen said, go with God. <laughs> so I said, thank you, sir. So now I have God on my side. So I have tried you know, I spent some time telling the story what had happened. One senator, senator said, is this the only drug or are there others like it? I said, sir, since you ask. So I listed another 12 drugs, hormones, antibiotics, and so on. Why I'm telling you this story is crucial to what we're talking about, Canada and its food safety. It is not just GMOs. You already heard, GMOs on their own cannot survive unless they have one or more pesticides or herbicides attached to them. They're weaker cells. They cannot survive against natural seeds. But when you put cover with glyphosate, 2,4-D, and now they're talking about uh, uh, smart stacks, six, seven, eight pesticides, that's the only, that's the advantage you're giving to this weaker seed. But then it's everywhere, but in our food supply, there are five things other than GMOs. Four more. Hormones, antibiotics, slaughterhouse waste, GMOs and pesticides. People look for solutions what to do. You, uh, organic food or not organic food or what to buy but to ask if you remove these five things from food supply automatically all food becomes organic you do not need to certify you do not need to ask in our country that's all what we have to do the European Union has already banned four out of those five those are hormones antibiotics slaughterhouse waste and GMOs, GMO is not completely because it's still in their animal feed, and, but they're also beginning to ban a number of pesticides. We in Canada and the United States have all those five and we are proving more and more of them. And when people raise issues, when a scientist from somewhere speaks, does a study like Sarah Lini, then the whole system comes upon them to discredit them, to fire them. Today is Dr. Wakefield for doing a study on uh, vaccines. Take away his license. Yes. Saralini, discredit him. Shiv Chopra, fire him. This goes on and every government department, every uh, 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 newspaper system, the scientific journals, they're all infested by this kind of corruption. There's nothing we can do. You say label, no, it's, 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 it's too little too late. Labeling something at the end of the process when the damage has been done will do nothing. It's like putting on cigarette packs, this will kill you. So what? People are still smoking. And children uh, uh, of all, young people nowadays are speak, uh, smoking more than older people. So. If you leave the poison out there, then labeling doesn't help. What we have to do is to ban these substances. They're poison. They're poisoning our food system. And they're creating disease in our children. And that disease is not something that you suddenly get ill. This is chronic disease. We have, we have autism now. We have... Uh, uh, diabetes increasing, obesity increasing, cancer increasing, whole bunch of chronic diseases due to which people will, from birth to the end of their <coughs> life, they will get chronic disease. And companies are very happy about it because then they give you drugs. Question I ask is this. 
if we scientists, just for telling the truth or publishing, even if the study is wrong, if we get castigated, if we get fired, number of companies in the last few years, Monsanto, Glaxo, Pfizer, uh, Merck, have all been fined billions of dollars for doing damage to public health. Why don't they get closed? Why don't the departments of health get fired, sent to jail? Because the Food and Drugs Act is attached to the Criminal Code of Canada. Anybody lies, anybody falsifies, that's what's supposed to happen to them. And as public, it's our country, it's our health, whether it's the Prime Minister or Minister or whoever, they're all public servants, they're all employees of the public. We all pay them. They're not the bosses. They cannot do what they are doing. People all over the world are going around out of frustration, occupy this, occupy that. I say, no, I don't want to occupy anything. Just de-occupy my body. Get lost. Leave us, leave my children, leave my community, leave my country, go somewhere else. Unless you're doing truthful things, you can make whatever money you want, but you cannot harm our health and society. In order to get there, you now have to mobilize. And mobilize not by going to grocery stores. Yes, you can say, are you using any of those five substances? Are you buying anything where five substances are used? Whether you go to a restaurant or a grocery store or wherever you go, the same question has to be asked. You cannot leave anybody out now and get your counselors. And BC has taken the first step. Your municipalities are beginning to, the counselors are beginning to say, forget Health Canada, forget the federal government, forget even the provincial government. We want to ban, uh, we want to make our area GM free. Right. Once you do that, the country will follow you. You're following, I don't know if you know it, knowingly or unknowingly, there is a legal precedent already. One municipality, Hudson, near Montreal, passed a bylaw many years ago that people did not want 2,4-D uh, or any pesticide, uh, uh, cosmetic use of pesticide on private lawns. <coughs> Simple. We in this municipality do not want it because it's toxic. It's, it's, our dogs are running there, our kids are running there. You can approve whatever you want. We don't want to use it in our homes. Once they passed that, the provincial, uh, the Quebec provincial government said, extended that. Okay, in that case, we'll, we'll do the same thing on public property, schools, and so forth. And companies are screaming. Health Canada has approved them. You guys have no jurisdiction. We'll sue you. And they did. And the matter went to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court ruled in favor of Hudson. From there on, many municipalities have done the same thing outside of Quebec. Inside and outside of Quebec. From there, now, BC has taken the lead. If BC and Quebec join up, will save our country. Mm -hmm. I think the time has come for that. Yeah. So mobilize your forces, go forward. This is our country, save it. Thank you.
There are board members in the, in the, in the room. Jan, please stand up. Jan Westland. She's been spearheading our campaign locally. Thank you. with that. We also have a number of um, uh, stuff that's going on as well through GE Free, the non-browning apple and uh, the GE Free um, alfalfa. We have browning apples here today, if you're curious to know what the difference is. Um, but there is a lot of movement going on for the non-browning apple in, in BC. There are petitions out there. I take them down. So before any more, we want to hear from you. Questions, I will moderate as best I can. Yes, Richard. Yeah, I'd like to thank you both very much for coming and the Ag Society for putting this on. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the study um, that you talked about with Sarah Leamy that's in the news right now, um, whether it was properly done. It seemed like the obvious thing would be to redo the study. If there's some question about the methodology that would seem to be easy, the easiest thing, is that happening? That's a very good question. The, uh, I mean, it is being done again. The French government has offered two million dollars, uh, two million uh, euros a year ago to to do the the study again. Not by Dr. Seralini, but somebody else in France. And I'm also told that the European Union has also put together a grant of three billion, three million uh, euros, also to do the same thing again. So of course they're very intrigued. Right after the the uh, study was published many countries decided to, to ban and regulate GMOs because this is like this is taken very seriously by the rest of the world. Only in North America. You know, we're in the corporate we're in the biotech bubble here. Larry and then Donald. A few years ago we were hearing uh, some very scary things that Monsanto and other companies were building in the what they call the terminator gene. Uh, they're trying to genetically engineer a seed that, that would be sterile, that, yeah. that could not reproduce, so that they didn't have to worry about farmers saving their seeds. And there was worry that the genetic contamination would could spread this into the wild, and we might end up with a whole lot of sterile organisms. Mm. I haven't heard anything about that for three or four or five years now, and I wonder if, if either of you could tell us, is this still a worry? Is it going on? Are you still working with Terminator gene? The, the, the technology is called uh, GERD. It's, it's an interference technology. It's, it's, it's ready. It's ready to go. It's on the shelf, ready to be used. Uh, there was such an uproar when Monsanto wanted to, uh, uh, to commercialize it a few years back. There was such an uproar worldwide that they decided to Rockefeller, the Rockefeller Foundation told them to put it on the shelf and leave it there. Uh, it's not good publicity, but it's it, it, they will use it sometime, yeah. So it is a worry, but it's not not being commercialized. Okay, thank you. Donald? Thank you again to both of you for coming here. Very much appreciate the information. My question's about uh, uh, soya or all of the those major uh, genetically modified crops. Can I trust when I go to the grocery store and I see a product that says, uh, organic soy, uh, soy that uh, I can trust that there's not been, uh, it's not been uh, contaminated by uh, the genetically modified Monsanto soy because it's everywhere. Yeah, the organic label is your best bet. They have, I mean, right from the start, the organic movement decided that they would have no, nothing like coexistence or you know they, they want absolutely nothing to do it is impossible it is absolutely impossible to have a completely non-contaminated product so they allow for one percent contamination and do they test for that um, so, yes oh yes 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 it is tested yes thank you there is a, a on organic there is a, a numbering system which only CFI knows, I think it's uh, number eight or nine, if it says, then it's GMO free. But the point is, it's not GMO per se alone that's doing the damage, uh, or even the final, not, not even the final product. It's the whole process of cultivating these things in the soil. 
that, that poison, that those pesticides are constantly coming in there. It's Bt toxin, it's this uh, pesticide, 2,4-D, is killing life. Even when the word antibiotic is used, you know, in people's perception, antibiotic is a good thing. But antibiotic kills. It's only you, it's, uh, it's good when it is needed in desperation to destroy certain bacteria. But when we are using bacteria, uh, antibiotics in a large scale, 80% of the antibiotic is used in, to feed animals, just to fatten the animals, or, or, uh, or, or the, uh, cover uh, unhealthy, unhygienic conditions. So all these things are toxic. And antibiotics, if, uh, whether it's uh, this antibiotic or that antibiotic, they all kill off good bacteria in our guts and those of the animals. Where do you think all this E. coli is coming up in slaughterhouses and so on? That's how it's happening. All these are toxic substances. Les, I think you were next. Earlier this year, the Supreme Court in the States kind of astounded people by ruling against myriad genetics over the BRCA1, BRCA2 gene tests, saying, no, you can't patent these because they're existing life forms. If you're familiar with that, is there any impact on genetically modified, the patents that cover the, the genes from Eli Lilly's products in Monsanto's that might, let's say, open up uh, the field against them, per se? Like, I'm just curious, because the Supreme Court surprised everyone. This is everyone. a historical question that living organisms and their products cannot be patented. It was decided by countries by universal decision. When penicillin came on the market, that's what was decided. Initiated by the United States government because the penicillin was, the invention belonged to Britain. And they said, we will not patent any living organisms and their products. But if you take a product and change it chemically, then the process can be patented. So now, uh, the US has uh, gone completely the other way. Uh, and, and so, the rest of the world, you cannot patent life. Now they're patenting genes, they're, they're patenting fish, they're patenting pigs, they're patenting everything. So uh, uh, very soon, I mean, this whole issue of apple right here, it's not uh, anything else. They want to do it to one apple, then continue, and then the, all the apples of the world will belong, belong to Monsanto. Because now it's a little company, Monsanto will go and buy up that company, and then they'll say, you can't grow an apple. It all belongs to Monsanto. That's what will happen. And that the companies are going really to control, not only, it's not just a question of safety, it's also security. So they, they, uh, they want to own everything. And the world is fighting against that. And I, I doubt if countries like China, India are ever going to come, uh, agree to that kind of control. In fact, they're fighting hard. This will not, this will not happen. Our prime minister is going around saying, you know, agriculture will control through intellectual property rights. Well, we'll see. Tony, and then Peter. Um, as a shopper, I'm just curious what on the shelves is GMO. I understand that corn, soy, canola, and sugar beet. Um, but what about like rice, wheat, tomatoes? I know you said sweet corn and uh, papaya as well. Okay, you're asking me what's in the yeah, store that's on Like, is there GMO wheat or uh, tomatoes mm -hmm. or? All the major crops have been engineered, but they're not necessarily all commercialized in Canada. For example, we do not have engineered potato in Canada. It is engineered, oh, it's been engineered for years. Mm -hmm. But both McCain, the biggest user, and McDo McCain, the biggest producer, and McDonald, the biggest users, 10 years ago, said no, they were too afraid of a public backlash and they would lose their customers. So we don't have engineered potatoes because of them, imagine. <laughs> Wheat and grains in Canada are not engineered, but they are sprayed with Roundup three days before harvest. So all your 
bakery or your grains in the store are laced with Roundup. Um, sweet corn, of course, is engineered. We seem to be the testing ground in Canada because it's not in the U.S. yet. Um, Wheat is not yet approved, but it has appeared in various now uh, situations, and uh, they're saying we don't know how it got there. Huh. Oh, that was in Washington State. Yeah, there was a, a case a few months ago of contamination. Yeah. Mm. Answer your question. Yeah. yeah. What about rice? Rice is not engineered. There is golden rice, and that's what you've heard. The golden rice is a rice that's yellow, and that contains some amount of pro-vitamin A, and it's a, uh, it's a, a, a public relation thing, it's a gimmick from the biotech industry, because if you don't approve, like, like when I say it's a distraction, then if you don't, I should feel guilty, because you know millions of children are going to be blind if they don't have golden rice. The golden rice has been has been in the works for 15 years, and it is not yet commercialized. It's not working. It doesn't work. Kids would eat, uh, have to eat at least 10 or 15 pounds of rice every day to get their vitamin A. It, it doesn't work. We have a question from Peter and then Gary. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, Dr. Chopper, I'd like to take my hat off to you uh, to say thank you for the what you stood up for with the... Uh, RTBH. My son and his family and my granddaughter has not had to drink that hormone treated milk. So I thank you very much for that. And a uh, couple of comments. Uh, in the glyphosate, um, I know there doesn't seem to be much testing in Canada, but I understand in Europe they've been testing urine samples from people in many different countries and found glyphosate to be shown excuse me, showing up in many people's uh, urine. Uh, so it, it is showing up, it's coming through our, our systems into, uh, so it is there. And the other comment that, uh, that's a curiosity for me is uh, in regard to contamination, cross-contamination from a, a genetically engineered crop over to a non-conventional you know, crop is to why we haven't been able to impose a trespass issue because if I put some of my stuff on somebody else's property, I should be, you know, I should be charged with trespass. And, and it's easy to uh, prove those patented genes being transferred on somebody else's property. So I just don't know um, why that hasn't somehow been an issue that's gone to the courts, you know. Corruption. I mean, we know what happened to uh, first Shishmaisu. Yeah. He was actually punished. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was punished. He lost half a million dollars defending himself. Mm -hmm. Somebody else's seed, he says, came into his trenches and he should have reported, said the Supreme Court. Percy Schmeiser is a perfect case because he was, he was a big guy and he was a councillor and a mayor and, yeah. uh, and a canola breeder and he was not going to yield. He went all the way to the Supreme Court. Yeah. And your question is, a, is, is, is great because the Supreme Court ruled this is patented technology, it's in your field, it shouldn't be there, you stole the technology, you are liable. Mm -hmm. He lost his case on hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in court uh, fees. And then his wife sued Monsanto for trespass. Hmm. No, good. And won. Six hundred dollars. Yeah, that was because they actually did prove that, that their plants ended up on his property. Well, both ways. Both ways uh, yeah. In both cases, Persich Meister himself actually didn't lose. He won the case. Yeah. But the Supreme Court said, but you still have to pay your court cost, which was half a million dollars. Uh, because you should have reported to Monsanto, they should have come and pulled out. So then, uh, uh, just to get revenge, his wife sued Monsanto, <laughs> saying, your canola is growing in my garden. And they won't come, so she sued them 600, for $600. Yeah. So that was, <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. But this is, this is the power of a corporation, really, what you have to, yeah, yeah. It's the, the world upside down. Well, it's, it's interesting you say that's the power of the corporation, but obviously the fact that she won that case spoke something of the power of what she was trying to demonstrate, right? So it's not all, it's, this isn't all conspiracy theory stuff, right? Now, when you say that the, 
that the, there's an increase in the use of pesticides for Roundup Ready crops. Are you talking about pesticides or glyphosate? Pesticide That's the question I have. When you say that the, um, the uh, industry has not been able to demonstrate one of their claims, which is a reduced use of pesticides, are you saying it's a reduced use of pesticides or a reduced use of glyphosate? Okay, glyphosate is the active ingredient in Roundup. The herbicide. I understand that. The herbicide I'm in the industry, so, so I can appreciate what you're talking about. What I'm saying is that I, as an integrated pest manager, we use several different pesticides in the cycle of different chemical groups in order to combat weeds. So in, in the case of Roundup Ready Corn, you're using a pesticide of a single chemical class in greater use because the plant has been engineered that way. Yes. Now, are you actually increasing pesticide use or are you just increasing use of glyphosate? You are increasing the use of Roundup right. because the technology has increased. Well, because it's it. 500 I million acres, I yes. But what it. I have read, and this is not my personal thing, this is not my field, what I've read also is that because the growers can spray again and again yeah. to get perfect weed control, they do. And that means that they're using a lot more per acre than but they used to. in industry, sir, we use a rotation of chemicals. So we may use Roundup as one. Well, that's, that's the whole point. So it's not just one pesticide. If your weeds have become resistant, you'll do two things. One, you will increase the amount of the same uh, herbicide. Yeah. And then you say, I'll add 2,4-D now, mm -hmm. because that's not working. Then you add a third one, fourth one, then it becomes a smart stack, as Monsanto was proposing. So in other words, overall use of pesticide or herbicide is increasing because your initial now, you one is that? no longer working. Can you actually demonstrate that? Oh, yes. That because, you know, in my, in my field, I actually reduce the use of chemicals because I use a rotation, I use integrated pest management. And uh, you know, so I understand a lot more than maybe the average person does here. So, you know, I think that the, I, I think that the use of pesticide is actually on the decrease. That's not true. It's not true. It's not true to you. You use the, uh, May I speak up? You no, use the uh, term, sorry, I, just, I, just, I, I want to insert that. Actually, uh, I, also, I also wanted to mention something about Bacillus thuringiensis. Can I finish your question? Oh, yeah, then absolutely, we'll, please. Then we'll come back to your okay. next one. Yeah. You, use, you, you said that you're an integrated pest manager. Yes, absolutely. Now, not everybody does what you do. No, well, you, actually, you, it is throughout BC that this is a practice. We're talking, is, North, Amer we're talking North American mm -hmm. and worldwide. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's very conceivable, it's understandable mm -hmm. that worldwide the farmers, not necessarily as educated as you are, do not follow the kind of integrated pest management that you do. This is why I think this should actually be opened up for debate, because you guys are coming here presenting a, a point of view, and it's not, it's not a debate. It's not a discussion. It's not a conversation. It's a point of view. And you're saying that, you know, when Alex Adamanko said, the so-called no you know, people that know things, you know, are, are deceiving us and that it, this is all a conspiracy by uh, the, the corporations like Monsanto and Dow Chemical and stuff. And man, I, I, I just really think that we need to open this conversation as a debate, as a, you know, you know, you know, you know my, I'll, t I'll tell you my personal uh -huh. opinion, my personal okay. vision here, because this used to be my field of work. No, I was not a, a, a field man, I was in the lab doing my research. And there was a certain paradigm that the technology was perfectly safe and perfectly fine, and I was completely oblivious to anything else. Mm -hmm. There's hundreds of research studies that show that it's perfectly safe and there is no concern and right. go back to sleep. Right. And that's what I call the biotech bubble. This is North America. You go to the USA, you go to that little green booklet in the back, and there's hundreds of studies there, mostly out of Europe, telling you, you should be very concerned. Mm -hmm. So, 
I, I, I didn't come here to, to, to debate or to have a conversation. I come here to give another balanced view because the biotech bubble tells people to go back to sleep. View, it's a point of view. No, uh, a point of view. You know, I, have, I know. I understand that. No, no, I know I'm presenting a point of view. But I'm just, that, that's why okay. I'm here. Is let to, me, let is me put to it add simply. something to this conversation. Let me put it very simply. 64 countries in the world today, yeah. I showed you the map, that have a point of view. Yes. They have scientists, Russia, China, Korea, Japan, all of Europe, etc., etc. They have scientists and government, and they looked at the evidence, and they have a point of view. Okay. And this is the question. By the way, this is, we're only telling you what we, we didn't do the studies. You personally may have done it on your fields. All these studies, including yours, have to be submitted to Health Canada. Yes. And it is the job of the company that uh, sells the product, not an individual standing up that I do this or that. I can also say on my property, I've never used a chemical and I'm fine. So, but that doesn't go anywhere. These studies, by law, has to be pulled together by the company that sells. I said that right at the beginning. They have to prove to Health Canada by submitting the studies. This is, we're not here to debate ourselves because otherwise you'll, you'll get anecdotal information. I've smoked for 94 years, I, I didn't die. Right. Okay, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's not study. Yeah. That's just I one individual it. standing and saying it. that. Okay. So Gary, we have another question. Sorry, and if I could have another one after that. Yes. Danji, you're next. Um, I actually did have a question. Uh, you know, speaking of points of views, Grand Forks in the outlying areas has used 2,4-D, and it's not a point of view. It's a proven fact that in Vietnam there are still children born with horrible deformities. Sorry. Right? Mm -hmm. And Roundup glyphosate, <coughs> or glyphosate, it's like a major problem in the groundwater in France. And I don't know how you're involved in all this. This is the first time I ever hear about it. You know, Grant Works used to be clean, a clean place. Mm -hmm. And suddenly we're spraying places along the river, parks. It's not okay. You need to ask That's the citizens of Grant Works. No, it's so not unqualified. It is absolutely no. unqualified. I can show you pictures of Please children do. in Vietnam. Please do. Gary, oh, well. do you have another question? Yes, I do. Actually, and this is about BT. Bacillus thuringiensis. Now, Bt is, of course, a approved pesticide for organic use. So I'm I'm kind of a, at odds at what <laughs> this Bt gene and the protein and all that kind of stuff. Why it's connected to all this disease and liver failure and all this other stuff. I, I'm 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 at a loss. I mean, we use this as a green or as a uh, biological uh, uh, tool in our pesticide toolbox, as opposed to using, say, diazinon or, or uh, <coughs> dimethoate or anything else. Bacillus thuringiensis crustaki, which is the one I use for, for caterpillars, um, is naturally occurring in the environment. So... Um, you may or may not know about the gene sequence of the yes, BT toxin. Well, you had mentioned it in your talk. The gene sequence of the BT toxin that is in the plant is not quite the same as the gene sequence of the bacteria okay, that so you use in dipel. So is it synthetic or is it artificial? You would call it synthetic if it has I'm just asking the question because there's a huge difference between the term synthetic and artificial, right? Uh, permethrins are chemically identical to permethrum, which is a naturally occurring molecule that comes out of chrysanthemum plants. Are you asking a question? It's produced, it's produced synthetically, <coughs> not artificially. Artificial is something that doesn't occur in nature. Bacillus thuringiensis crustacei occurs in nature. We're not talking about BT spray. We're not talking about BT spray. This is a gene that is injected, taking from bacillus thuringiensis, which is injected now into a cotton or, or yeah. a, a corn or whatever. Now the plant, just the example I gave, now the plant thinks 
it is bacillus thuringiensis, and it, it's supposed to produce this toxin to fight whatever is, was coming at the bacteria. Okay? These studies have been done extensively outside, in India, for example, where sheep have died, people have developed allergies, because the animals that eat forage on these plants have died. There, there are lots of studies uh, doing that. And then when you do something like this, the plant, I gave the example, the plant the size of a cotton, which is the size of a, almost a tree, thinks it's that bacteria is constantly secreting this toxin. And to defend as a bacteria, and any pests come on it, it, it um, breaks down their intestinal tract. Mm -hmm. That's how Bt works. Yeah, okay? So it is a biological, all right, the same as an antibiotic uh, uh, kills from a bacteria, another bacteria. Mm -hmm. So this is what's happening. But the same toxin is coming out now. It's, if it's affecting the insect's intestine, and it also insects uh, uh, ingested on a regular basis by people and animals and so on, where all these other diseases are coming along at the same time, you at least have to wonder, because we're talking about health of people, yeah. that why are these diseases, celiac diseases, and all, all the gluten, this and that, all kinds of things that are happening, we are disturbing the biome of the intestinal right. tract of animals and people. It's not as simple as you just kill a pest and, and then forget about it, because the toxin hasn't left. It's there. Right. That's what happens with genetic engineering. To answer your question, yes, the gene sequence, as to use your word, is artificial. So it's not The gene sequence of Bt, the Bt crystalline yeah. proteins, yeah. that are in the plant are not the same as what's in the bacteria. So is that simple? They, well, I, I'm just, I, just okay. I would just ask. No, 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 but I, I'm, I have to. What do you to, mean? Like, I'm sorry? Like, were they put together artificially, or yes. or is it taken from the genes the sequence from the, and the gene sequence from the, the bacteria mm -hmm. is not the same as from the nudge, but is in the plant is not the same as what's in okay. the plant. Can I give you my card, because I'd really like some more information on this? Absolutely. Okay. Because um, yes, I'm just too. I'm just at a loss. Okay, I, mean, I will make a suggestion. Yeah, you can download that publication, and all the information you need to read is in that publication. Okay. One of the things, or you can pick up one of the other table over there. Is there anyone out there? Other yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. and as far as we are concerned, we can stay here as long as we need. Okay. This lady in the back here. Um, well, my original question was more about uh, bees, and there's a new uh, pesticide, uh, neo can you, can you speak up a bit? My first question, was, I guess, was about bees and a new pesticide uh, using nicotine. But seeing as we're expressing points of view, I just want to say, you know, it's, everyone's welcome to their point of view. And what I would like to see, personally, is labeling, so that when I go to the grocery store, I have enough information at hand to exercise mine. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's really important that we label our food and then we can all read our studies and get our information and you know, choose how we spend our dollars with the information on the label. And uh, yeah, anyway, back to bees. <laughs> Thank you. What's your question about bees? I just wondered about the, um, there was a lot of, yeah, there was information about um, genetically engineered crops uh, possibly causing the decline in bees or being one part of the decline in bees. One, of, one is the monocrop culture as well. Um, but now there's a new type of pesticides, neonicotinoid. Yeah, you know? they're, they're actually you know? not new. They're, they've been around for a long okay. time. Um, I've just recently heard of them. And lots, of seeds, lots of seeds are coated with pesticides, insecticides, fungicides. And the insecticide, the neonicotinoid, this gentleman probably knows a lot more than I do. But it's not just necessarily just genetically engineered seeds that are coated with the neonicotinoid. But the neonicotinoids are now banned in Europe. Because it's, it's very obvious that there is definitely a link to the, uh, the bees. And, and in Canada, it, I think it's happening, but very slowly. We're a little slow here. Okay, next question. Jan, and then Donna. My question and is actually to Pastor Smith-Gary. Um, are the crops that you are using infected 
pest management, are they GMO crops or are they? Uh, some are, yeah? some are, yeah. So you don't feel compelled to use the, the Roundup enforcing mechanism no, no, that I, the company refers to? I, I think, uh, personally, th uh, you know, how he defined or how this gentleman defined GMOs is not how I define GMOs. I think we have different definitions on that. Mine is broader. His is just about, you know, glyphosate, Roundup ready uh, crops. GMOs are way huger than that. You know, Gary, I mean, you stepped out for quite a while. I was here for the, the okay. big portion of your definition of what GMOs were. Yes. I saw the greatest part of that presentation. So that's what I understood you to be saying that GMOs are crops that are made Roundup ready or engineered to be. 90% of all right. of the engineered crops on the planet today are engineered to tolerate the herbicide Roundup. Exactly. Exactly. That's the reality. So, so I, so 10 to 15% are engineered to be their own pesticide, the yeah. BT. Yeah. Everything else is tiny, tiny, tiny under distraction. Yeah. Well, Particularly strawberries, golden rice. strawberries have a fish gene in them. No, they don't. What? Let him. <coughs> this is not a, de a debate, Gary. This is, you yeah. know, we're here to ask him questions. Well, if it's well, not a debate, then, what comes you know, if it's all just you, about you don't have to servicing someone's opinion. I mean, we can, Pardon me? You don't have to monopolize this. We can let other people speak out. And then we can I'm come sitting and down here. I'm yeah. sitting down. I'm taking okay, my turn. I think we have Dawn next. I was. I know that in organic farming, some use some farms use BT. I think, and they spray, but it doesn't stay or last. But mm. with the BT, when it's genetically in the plant, it's in every single cell, and it's there all the time. So it's that, from my understanding, that's just one comment. Of, um, yeah. The other thing I wanted to talk about was trees. Um, um, and I had seen a documentary that was narrated by Dr. Suzuki, but um, I wanted like clarification here. So if there's some trees that are growing and there's pollination and movement and they're genetically modified trees and they go <coughs> into our um, government or our, you know, our lands, publicly owned lands, can companies say that they're their trees then as they spread? Um, are there issues of you know, um, what, what stays ours, you know? Yeah, we, we, we tend to here uh, talk about food. We're, we're sort of about focused on food, yeah. so we don't touch about the trees. Of course, there are some uh, species of trees that are engineered to make uh, better, easier, cheaper processes for uh, paper and, and, you know, without lignin or with much less lignin in the tree, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. And you're correct that it's the same principle again. If, uh, if the pollen flies into your lot and your trees are now engineered or your seeds are engineered and you plant those seeds, then those trees will be engineered and you have stolen the technology. And ethanol to drive cars. That's a huge, huge spread. That's, that's for corn, yes. Um, we have Cher and then Laura. Cher? Hi, thank you very much. Um, 64 countries are not using GMOs, correct? That, that was your map? 64 <laughs> countries require labeling of because, food items right. or have regulated GMOs in one way or another okay. or are banning GMOs, meaning like there is absolutely no growing the crops, no so feed. What countries are the, do you know which country is banning GMO? For Hungary, Hungary, Romania, Peru, and a few others, and I don't really know okay. the details of that. So my question is, what are they using then? Um, mm. What are they using they to control the weeds? They are farming and feeding themselves very well, thank you. No, I mean, what are they using to, to, to control the weeds in their crops? They are using Roundup and other herbicide like we used to until the advent of this technology. Oh, okay, so Roundup works. Roundup is a big, is Roundup is a very successful herbicide. It has very little acute toxicity. It's the, chemi the, the, the chemical industry says it's as safe as aspirin. <laughs> Compared to many other pesticides, it's very safe. But it is a chelating agent. 
and an antibiotic. Yeah, that's the answer. And that's where the problem stands. It's a very insidious, long-term process. Well, the scientist who develops a new approach to attacking weeds without genetically modifying the crops is going to be... Well, you're going back in time here. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, it, just, uh, but, but, but like I said, there's so many countries in the yeah. world that do not use this technology in the fields. Absolutely. So the, why are we so slow here in, in Canada? Or the, well, we are in the biotech. The North American we are in the biotech bubble. We're right next to. I mean, Canada is way too close to the to the U.S. border. That's what I say. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Industrial military complex. So, Laura, you're next. I have a one question on the food security. This was supposed to provide food for the world and we would eliminate poverty and eliminate diseases. Obviously it hasn't. So can you speak a little more on that, on how it has affected poverty in the world? Right now, there's seven billion people on Earth. Right now, there's enough food for 14 billion people already. The world population is projected to increase to its maximum by 2050, and it will be 9 billion people. Industry is saying they want to double the amount of food. It's already doubled. Mm -hmm. So that means it will be for 28 billion people, mm -hmm. because it's enough right now for Talking about poverty, it is not the shortage of food. It is the corruption by people all over the world not letting the people who are producing have food. <laughs> people who are producing food are not able to have food. 270,000 farmers in India have committed suicide. The government is not believing it there. But this farmer who now input costs have gone so high uh, uh, the only one crop which is approved in India as GMO is cotton, BT cotton. And they pretended it was not food, but cotton seed oil is, and uh, the animals are uh, foraging on it and, and, uh, and getting, uh, and people are getting rashes and allergies and so So it's, it's a serious problem. So as far as food is concerned, the, the idea that the companies are saying we're going to feed the hungry world. Right now, the hungry, feed, hungry world is feeding us. Most of our food, a lot of our food is being imported. We can't compete against India, China, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, whatever. And it won't be long if this goes on. In five years, our agriculture will be wiped out. Average age of Canadian farmer is right now over 60. Mm -hmm. And only 1% people are in the farming trade now. And if we cannot compete, forget our farming. So security is, has a, is a double-edged sword. We're not secure at home. The same companies are buying land in Africa, Sub-Sahara, India, contract farming. They're moving agriculture overseas. Why so, do you think that is? Well, what do you think? I mean, uh, companies want to make money. They, they take their capital wherever the labor is cheaper. Wherever the input cost for them is cheaper and less work. So they, and then they produce over there, slaughterhouses there, rendering plants next door, and then Walmart <coughs> brings food from everywhere. That, that's the modern, in, modern uh, movement of uh, uh, any goods. That's what's happening. So, uh, I don't know this claim of feeding the hungry world. It doesn't, math doesn't add up at all. Um, we have Roma, then Donna, and then Gary. You're proportionalizing things here, okay? Two questions. Where in Canada has the GMOC been released in the wild? Speak. And I understood that Canadian wheat was um, very much prized. I don't quite understand why the Canadian wheat pool was um, cancelled or mm -hmm. disbanded. Wheat board. It's the wheat board. And, wheat board. Yeah. and I understood there are places like Japan and, and Europe that want 
they did want Canadian wheat, so I don't understand why the wheat board was the same. The wheat board and uh, these two are uh, two, two separate two, questions. Just, yeah. Only Mr. Harper knows why he disbanded the wheat board, and he's on to disband all other boards also. Mm -hmm. This supply management was established by Canada a long time ago to protect our farmers so that they don't overproduce. That way they'll manage, they'll sell where it's needed. But the world, the rest of the world has come up in food production since we grew too much wheat and the United States. And then other countries are producing their own and uh, selling in competition with us. So uh, what do we do with these boards and so on? Uh, in every trade agreement, whether it's now with Europe or with Asia, you'll find the word agriculture there. But there's a provision. In any trade agreement, every country has the right, if it concerns public safety, then they have the right to establish or override the trade agreement, what's called the phytosanitary uh, 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 needs of the country. They will establish. That's why the European Union would not allow our beef to go over there because they have banned the use of hormones. Mm. And also they have banned the use of antibiotics. They have banned the use of slaughterhouse waste. And they're ban beginning to ban pesticides. They have not yet allowed uh, GMOs. So I don't know how Mr. Harper is going to succeed on those. They'll never relent on that. So time will tell what happens. Donna? I'm going to try to be re really quick. Um, I was looking on the Canadian government website and uh, I saw acknowledgement of super weeds and the insects getting um, you know, resistant, and this is a common thing. Um, I've also heard about um, there's people who are doing experiments in growing things differently, push-pull, where insects are, there are plants that they want to get away from and there's plants that they want to go to and arranging them with your growing so then you don't have the, those other issues that we have with the super weeds and those things developing resistance. But the other thing that people might want to research more is something called agroecology. And I've heard, and, and, and that's something that they're talking about maybe can help feed people more if people have small farms and they're growing and then they, they, have, they have food they have something to trade and make money, and it's a way of um, food being distributed, and also you don't have to transport it so far, and everyone's empowered. And um, in Russia, I've heard in different um, situations, they have something in Dacha, so they travel outside of the city on weekends, and they go to the farm, and they're growing things there, and they come back for the week. So having land available for all people to grow and to share. So there are other things that are experimented that we don't have the complications of super weeds then and the other things. So there are ideas being explored. Thank you. In other areas except, except the U.S. and Canada. Um, okay, we have Gary again, then Dawn, and then Peter. Keep it short, Gary. Well, no. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, glyphosate. You, uh, you had mentioned that uh, uh, many plants are, are laced with glyphosate. Glyphosate breaks down relatively quickly. And I guess my question is that if, uh, I think a gentleman there had mentioned that tests were being done where glyphosate was found in the urine, uh, isn't that an indication that it's not actually being metabolized by the body, that it's actually being passed through, uh, not affecting people? I mean, we all know that in every food industry, Potatoes, onions, throughout this valley, everything that is grown that isn't in an organic farm has been treated with pesticides and that there's a what's called a pre-harvest interval. And some pesticides require two weeks, some a week, some three days. Um, so I guess what I'm asking, like when you mentioned that we're all eating pesticide laced or glyphosate laced uh, Foods, are we? Are you sure? Oh yes. And how is it affecting us? 
If you find it in your urine, yes, it had to go through your intestine first. Okay. It's patented as an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. What do you think an antibiotic does in your intestine? Well, I, I don't know. It kills the bacteria in your intestine. But I'm a pretty healthy guy. I know. I'm just letting you know. That's like what my, it does. I, I think my gut flora is still all pretty good. Okay, so I'm that's just, I'm just, you're asking me a question, I'm giving you an answer. Well, I'm it's just not saying, an opinion. I'm just saying, well, I if think it, it stirs up. in your urine. Yeah, I, I think it stirs up fear in people. It's not a difficult at the same time as you do. Jerry, I'll go to your talk another time. Donald is next. Donald's got the next. And just one just small point, small point. On integrated pest management. Next, please. Yeah. Integrated pest That's management. Gary, Gary no more. Yeah. None yeah. of us will yeah. hear it. As you will. You make a speech some other time. All right. Sorry. See you guys. See you. I didn't go in the urine. She's not reading. She I mean, Gary. it goes through your liver, it goes through detox, through your kidney, it goes through all the system. It doesn't appear in the urine just like that. It's gone. <laughs> Your question. Yeah, as someone who opposed the Ministry of Forest uh, uh, herbicide firm for Roundup in 1995 in Grand Forks here, mm -hmm. we had an expert from uh, uh, Langara College, uh, an environmental uh, scientist, as our witness, presenting information that uh, uh, on Japanese studies on glyphosate. And it's really interesting because, you know, we talk of conversations around these poisons and we, we actively engage the community and we had three members of the Environmental Appeal Board in Grand Forks on this. And it always ends up, you know, they'll, they'll listen to you, they'll listen to all your, 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 your scientists, all your proofs and whatnot, and when it boils down to, it's a, a kind of a two, three sentence uh, of uh, resolution, sorry, it's not in our realm. It's the, this poison is a, or this pesticide is approved by uh, the Canadian uh, Ministry of Health. Therefore, it's not our responsibility. No. But this, th these material, and our concern then was uh, the downstream effect that they're they're pumping this into the forest, and this is like this is like almost 20 years ago. They're pumping this into the forest. It's coming down into, into the, 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 the streams and water. And I mean, I dare say that our aquifer is contaminated with, like we know already, with all kinds of certain poisons, but we're not testing for all these poisons. You know, it's pathetic, right? And, and we have like this man here that we're, you might not know, but this man is a counselor in the city of Grand Forks. And he's basically representing my health and everybody else's health here. And he's in a, like legally, he's in a conflict of interest yeah. position. You because got to he, out. What's that? You got to vote him out. Of no, here. I know, but it's, yeah. it's a legal, it's no longer, it's, it's not a question of politics. It's a question of law, like you were saying. <laughs> This man is in a conflict of interest. You need to take his chair. Stand by like no. <laughs> yeah. So, thank so you, So my question is, how, where, where do you go with that kind of, you know, like this is where no, we are in BC. You, you're getting the answer. That's why I told the story of BGH elaborately. I saw that it, it's printed. Nobody's refuted it. It's there. That's what I told the story. If the government goes corrupt, then this man keeps on saying Health Canada has approved it. I'm saying Health Canada, my boss, my department is corrupt. Yeah. So uh, he can go on that basis when there's evidence this is how the uh, products are being approved. Mm -hmm. So how can you argue with him? He, he doesn't know the fundamentals of toxicology. He's, he talks about urine. And I, I call him back. How does a product appear in the urine when you've eaten it? It must go through your whole body to then come out there. While it's passing through, it's doing damage. We have a question here from Peter, and I think we may take one more after Peter. <coughs> Unfortunately, Gary doesn't understand that he has something like 10 times the number of bacteria in his gut than he has cells in his body. Right. <laughs> and that hey, that's we, need we, we need those. We need those to be healthy. 
But anyway, and unfortunately Gary's not here because I, I answered a, uh, there was a, a fellow from out of the lake who sent a letter into the editor uh, about GMOs. And I sent the letter back in. And, and my uh, comment on that was that it becomes a, a, the terminology gets a little mixed up because a genetically modified, as you explained earlier, can be a, a hybridized plant. Mm. And that can it not no, be? No. Is it not no. genetically no. changed? No. Genetically engineered is lateral gene transfer. That's what bacteria do. Yeah, here, stand next to me and I'll give you some of my genes. Yeah. That's genetic engineering. Mm. Yeah. Hybridizing and breeding is sex. But does not the genes No, change. you don't pass your genes to your neighbor. You have sex with your neighbor. <laughs> That's the only way you can do breeding. Plants <laughs> 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 and, and, and animals do sex, thank God. Yeah, and I agree. Yeah, and, and that's that's it. And it's a confusion, you know. I mean, like I, I I talk of distraction and confusion because it's easy to confuse people and go back to sleep. It's all very safe, and it's not the case at all. We have not been modifying plants for ten thousand years. We have been breeding plants for ten thousand years. Genetic engineering is thirty years old. Exactly, and it's a completely different ball game. Right. I just was under the impression that when you hybridize. Yeah. Things change so that you know because when you when you take the seed from a hybridized plant, something has changed. Yes. Hybridization is done by breeding. Yes. yes. It, has to do, it has nothing to do with genetic engineering. Hybridization. I agree. It's okay. within the same species. Yes. You cannot cross species. No. That's the difference. I because you here you're taking bacteria and mixing with plants yeah. or humans with this and that, you know, a mouse gene to put into the goat and those kinds of things. Uh, but if it's within the species, you, you uh, that, that's that's called breeding. You improve certain characteristics, but you can't uh, go across. Did you did you get your question answered, Peter? Um, come back. Yeah. Okay. All right, Donna, I think, I think and that will be the last question, unless someone's got a real burning one. No, okay, Donna. Yeah. I saw a lot of bravery in this room, but I wanted to say that I was really grateful that Gary Smith came. He came into a room where he knew there would be a whole bunch of people who wouldn't necessarily have his view. And um, there was an opportunity for sharing and growth. These scientists have also done this coming to Grand Forks. And I'm ever so grateful. And I'm, um, I would like to see more and more of this, and more and more sharing, more and more thinking. Um, I, we're, you know, we we are gifted as humans to think about things, and um, we can figure things out. Um, people here are here because they care. But anyways, I, I just wanted to say I hope we can make room for all of us, the scientists who may have some different information as well as people like Gary, everyone, and find a way to, to work this through. We're all in it together. We all affect each other and see what we can do. Thank you so much. Thank you.